it's my pleasure now to bring you my charge to the second session of the 56th Synod of the Diocese of Auckland. Tēnā koutou katoa. We make history today as we gather in a virtual forum to convene the Synod of the Diocese. I recognise the restrictions that this form of gathering places on us and the challenges it creates for engaging in effective debate. With the uncertainty created by the recent lockdown and our remaining in higher alert levels, I decided that we could not confidently plan for a postponed synod and that we should meet in order to attend to business of necessity. The synod statute requires that we hold an annual meeting. And though I think we could have been forgiven this year if we hadn't met, it seemed important to me that we do more urgent work together and not risk having to find other mechanisms for it, none of which would have been ideal. This seemed the best way uh, to move on business that needed to be done. Hence, in addition to normal procedural matters that we've now attended to, we will attend to the City Mission Bill. That bill will allow the board to appoint additional members to manage an enhanced workload through the Home Ground Project. And we will elect members to the vacancies on diocesan council. I consider these various matters to be non-controversial and thus not significantly affected by the inevitable constraints that we have on debate. At the same time, I am sorry that we are not able to do other work that people had taken time to prepare for our consideration. As I've said, it may yet be that we could hold a special session of Synod before the end of the year and undertake some of that. But time and circumstances will tell. In the hope with the, that we can do so, uh, we have set aside the following dates uh, for us to be able to meet in the cathedral. It will need us to be in level one, but in the faith that we may be, uh, we have set the 20th and 21st of November, a Friday and a Saturday for that purpose. You might be interested to know that apart from uh, Waiapu, uh, a diocese that obviously has considerable more faith than the rest of us, um, they're planning to meet in person at the end of October. But each of the other synods of the New Zealand diocese will meet in a virtual forum this year. Uh, Te Piho Patanga or Te Tai Tokiro are also meeting in this way and they will gather uh, this coming weekend, a week from now. My charge this year will focus mostly on COVID-19, our experience and response to it. But although that has dominated our lives this year, we have not allowed it to control us. So I will also attend briefly to a number of other things. Charge is going to be available both in written form as usual, but also as a video. And those, uh, both those uh, pieces of media will be available later today on the Diocesan website. I guess they'll be there just in case the adrenaline rush this first time live isn't quite enough for some of you. In memoriam, as is our custom, I invite us now to pause and to give thanks for former members of the Synod who have died since we last gathered. In the House of Clergy, the Reverend Philip Sellis, the Reverend Terry Malloy, the Reverend Christopher Ison, the Reverend Jill Renner, the Reverend Phyllis Tailby, the Reverend Peter Davy. In the House of Laity, John Allen, the parish of Pukekohe and Diocesan Sustainability Field Worker. George Palmer, latterly of the parish of Devonport, but for many years a member and synod rep of the parish of Waimati North and a former secretary uh, of our committees in synod. Alistair Park, 
parish of Pukekohe and a former diocesan secretary. David Juby, parish of Thames. Ian Wilson, parish of One Tree Hill. Helen McCormick, from the parish of Clevedon. Dorothy Wood, the uh, Beachlands Maraitai Mission Venture. Colleen O'Brien, the Beachlands Maraitai Mission Venture. Dee McConey, the parish of Royal Oak, and a long-term uh, teacher at Diocesan School for Girls. Brother Damien Kenneth SSF, the first director of Vaughan Park. We pause in silent memory and in prayer. Rest eternal grant unto them, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon them. COVID-19. I'm not telling you anything you don't know when I say that the onset of this global pandemic has had an incredible impact on every aspect of life and well-being, physical health, economic security, mental health, and organizational capacity, to name a few categories. We are aware of how well we have fared in Aotearoa, New Zealand, in terms of containing the disease and thus minimizing the impact of illness and of death. What none of us know for sure is the impact that this will have on people's lives in the medium to long term. Support provided by the government has assisted many businesses to retain staff in the meantime and for people to manage financial commitments to housing. But there is a limit to this and the latest experience of lockdown, especially in the Auckland Council area, has further deepened the economic uncertainty which has flow-ons into the lives of people and households. Church life, of course, has not been immune to this. On the whole, most of our ministry units are weathering it well with their own careful financial controls, along with initial support from the government wage subsidy and diocesan quota relief. We are thankful that a larger than expected end of year surplus from trust management uh, in 2019 provided the diocesan council with additional reserve funds to allocate to the kind of support that we are providing. Of more significance to us has been the impact on the expression of our life through not being able to physically gather for worship, fellowship and pastoral care. It has reinforced for me what an incarnational church we are, and the extent to which we experience and express the love of God through our corporate life. Not that our corporate life has been suspended, however. Clergy and other leaders in our ministry units responded immediately to the challenges presented by the March lockdown, found ways to keep worshipping communities connected together through the nine Sundays of that first period. Clergy quickly adapted to that challenge, decided on a strategy, and learned the new skills they needed to implement it. For many, this was a first step into using digital technology to gather for worship. For others, it was an enhancement of work which they had already experimented with over the years. But why, by whatever means uh, people maintained that contact and led worship, from the simplest means to the most high tech, I've heard nothing but thanks from people that an effort was made, uh, that they were able to still feel part of their community of faith and worship, connected to one another in it. The old-fashioned telephone tree had its power as well, 
lots of people I have spoken to have told me how much they appreciated a call from someone else to check on how they were doing. The power of simple human contact. The archdeacons tell me there was a very high attendance in virtual cluster meetings of clergy that colleagues have found great support and encouragement from one another as they have shared ideas and resources. It is moments like these that we realize the great value of being a diocesan church with those connections innately part of us. Quite a few clergy have told me about those they know who work in more uh, congregational traditions and other churches where those networks of support have been largely absent. I know how hard people have been working, the frustration of constant rescheduling or the cancelling of plans and the, lo the loss of momentum that results from that. Kindness has been the virtue that we have been encouraged to exercise as uh, a nation community. And I talk talk over that along with an encouragement to be patient with one another as we make our way through this. I'm very aware of the levels of tiredness and stress that people are feeling. And I hope that we can show deep and genuine care for one another as we continue to make our best efforts. I must pay great credit to the Episcopal team and to the Nelligan House team as a whole, who together have maintained our corporate diocesan life so well through these months. We've tried to pitch our comms as well as we can, providing the best advice and information that we could, while trying not to impose particular mechanisms for implementing it, so that you've had the freedom to adapt it in your own place. I'm so very grateful to work as part of such a skilled, committed and supportive team here. There is much for us to learn from what we are experiencing, especially about what it means to exist as an online church, what community means in these uh, different times, uh, the implications for sacramental life and so on. The Reverend Dion Blundell has agreed uh, to my invitation to convene a working group that will gather up those learnings so that we don't lose them and to see what uh, part they should play in our ongoing ministry. Many people have spoken about uh, the different people. They realized they were reaching in an online way, a whole different community of people who are uh, not normally part of our life, who don't normally come to church. There are good things for us to learn through this experience. I believe that this crisis has further emphasized what was already a societal trend. And that is that people are moving away from global and uh, looking for a genuine experience of what it means to live connected into a local community. At our best, as an Anglican church, we know a lot about that, and we know how to do it well. As I said at the start of my address, uh, there's so much more to our life apart from our COVID response. So beyond what uh, I've said about that, I do also want to give you a taste of that in lots of other areas of our life that are continuing and progressing. Sustainability. One of the ways in which greater interest in local is being seen is a desire by people to live more sustainably. We have been pushing into this area more in recent years as a diocese and beginning to make more tangible commitments to what it means as a church to live in a sustainable way. We were shocked and saddened by the sudden death of John Allen, our diocesan sustainability field worker for a number of years. John died not long after Synod last year. John was a champion and a prophet for sustainable living. 
Kathy by Riley has stepped brilliantly into that space for us as our uh, new sustainability field worker and is providing excellent leadership. Dossison Council has approved work proceeding on the Auckland Anglican Response to Climate Change Plan and we are taking steps to implement that at Nelligan House with our own going green strategy. Uh, we've started with simple things like improved recycling bike stands available for those to make their way here by that non-carbon mechanism and a food waste composting system. We'll be working on more over the months to come. Adjust have a particular focus on climate justice and they, Cathy and the Climate Change Working Group along with the Social Justice Working Group are collaborating well together to advance this work. We are currently in the season of creation and I'm glad to know that quite a few ministry units are theming worship around that aspect of mission and ministry during these weeks. The Auckland City Mission. The mission came to birth in the wake of a global pandemic, the flu epidemic of 1919. And this year, it celebrates its centenary right in the midst of another. The mission was one of the agencies that was able to carry on its services to the community right through level four, to ensure that the homeless were given shelter and that the hungry were fed. This was at some cost to their staff, a number of whom had to isolate from their own families in order to provide support to others in need. I was impressed by the collaboration between the mission and the ATWC at that time. While some of ATWC social workers could not do their normal work, they volunteered and jumped in with the mission team to support them. We congratulate the City Mission on 100 years of service to the people of Auckland and beyond. We are excited by progress on the Mission Home Ground project, and we look forward to that opening and the enhancement of services it will provide. During the debate on the City Mission Bill later on, the City Missioner Chris Farrelly will be able to tell us a little more about all of that. The Royal Commission of Inquiry. In 2018, the government announced that it was establishing a Royal Commission to inquire into the experience of people who have uh, suffered abuse in care. Originally intended as the state's inquiry, uh, the church and others lobbied to be included as having been a significant provider of institutional care through the period under examination, the 1950s onward. Among the churches, the Anglican Church is one focus for the Commission, along with the Catholic Church and the Salvation Army. We will appear at hearings, uh, likely to be early next year, as part of an examination into processes of redress and the experience of those who brought complaints to us. Church has a commitment to facing our past, responding well to what we hear, and improving our actions for the future. Tikanga relationships. We remain committed to good engagement with our Tikanga partners, especially to Tai Tokiro, with whom we have the most significant share of life in the diocese. Diocesan Council was able to offer an additional gift to Tai Tokiro this year beyond our usual partnership contribution. We have established a new partnership commission to maintain better connections and to build mutual support across the three tikanga within the diocese. Over the past year, we have been working with Ngāti Whātua or Arapo or Orake to seek to resolve an historic issue relating to the sale of land at Orake by the church, uh, which should have been returned to Ngāti Whātua. This is unrelated to our former site at St. James Church and is a much more historic land issue. 
We've made good progress in our discussions with their trust board representatives, and we hope that we can bring this to a conclusion in coming months. Ministry development. This year's ministry conference could not be held in person, and so we gathered online for two sessions over two days. This has been followed up by uh, what we've called uh, Rev Talks, a little shamelessly uh, hanging on the tailcoats of some other famous online talks. So our Rev Talks are short professional development presentations that are provided online and which licensed ministers are able to watch in their own time and then to discuss uh, in corporate forum. Suicide awareness training has begun with good numbers attending and very positive feedback from participants about the quality of resourcing that has been provided for this really important need of ministry development. A new strategy for lay training is needed and work on that is getting underway so that we can provide a program that equips lay people well for the exercise of their ministry within the church and beyond. At Glen Innes, we are about to embark on a new ministry venture that will provide for full-time ministry in the parish for the first time in many years. A partnership between the parish, uh, the diocese, and the Anglican Trust for Women and Children will make all of this possible. Joel and Hinemoa Carpenter will get underway there later this year. A long hope of mine has been to establish some young adult intentional communities. And we're working with Northwest Anglican Parish to partner on this as our first foray into that part of ministry. These will be residential communities for a small group of young adults will uh, flat together, but with a rule of life and uh, with a commitment to ministry together. My hope is that we will be able to replic replicate this model in some other places over the years to come. The Dossison website is undergoing a major overhaul to make it a more useful and accessible resource for us all and to offer a fresh image to visitors. The existing content's been shifted onto a new and more flexible platform now, and we're working on reorganizing the content and improving it to be able to relaunch the website, hopefully by the end of this year. St. John's College Trust Board has made a fund available for new ministry that responds to the changed environment resulting from COVID. And we will be submitting an application for significant funding to allow for enhanced digital presence in our ministry units. The Diocesan Development Fund has been rebuilt in recent years with more funds available. And so there's a focus on making those funds available now in a more uh, transparent way for people to, ministry units to apply to, to provide for new projects, which will allow ministry to be established and grow in new ways. Beyond building projects, that's been our past focus, there is an emphasis on innovation that will enable the church to respond to changing contexts and to reach new groups of people. In conclusion, I thank you for your commitment to the life of the church in this diocese uh, through your membership of the Synod. We have much to be thankful for and much to look forward to, which gives us hope. But most of all, we celebrate the privilege that it is to be called in the service of the gospel and to proclaim and uncover the kingdom of God in our midst. Kia ora tato katoa.